This lecture will discuss the use of the onboard timer modules within a PIC microcontroller. In previous lectures, we've analyzed timing by counting the number of clock cycles, looking at each command, and how long it takes for one command to work, and how quickly each instruction cycle passes by based upon the frequency of the crystal oscillator connected to our microcontroller. There are internal features within our PIC that also allow us to set some timing and to not waste clock cycles by going through loops with no ops and wasting counting of clock cycles that way. So with the built-in timer features, we can actually decide on an amount of time that we want to elapse and then handle that once that time has elapsed. In this lecture, we will introduce how at a fundamental level to do that and then in a future lecture when we talk about interrupts we will get into how to handle when that timer event has expired. So counters and timers go hand in hand. So all of the timer modules that we have can also be used as counters to count rising or falling edges of an input pin on the pick. So there are external pins that are attached to counters. So every time you have a rising or a falling edge on that particular pin, it can count that and you can track how many times that happened. You can set up an interrupt, which we'll talk about later, when an overflow of that counter occurs. And so when you get to a certain level and then you go from, say, FF to zero by incrementing from 255 to 256, which you can't handle within 8 bits, that will be an overflow and that can be handled by an interrupt. Much more on interrupts in a future lecture. So, timers allow us to do the same thing as counters, but to track time, not necessarily discrete events which could occur rapidly or could occur slowly over time, but to track the number of clock cycles that have passed. And we can also scale our timers to either count each and every instruction clock cycle that happens, every other one up to every 256 clock cycles, which allows us to change how often our timer module will overflow and trigger an interrupt. So within the PIC 16 f 1719 there are several timers and counters. We will primarily be focusing on timer 0 and timer 1. Timer 0 is an 8-bit timer which uses the TMR0 register to count the number of clock events. And you can also use it as a counter by using the T0CKI, which is short for Timer 0 Clock Input Pin, which is the same as pin RA4. There is a 3-bit prescaler which determines whether you're counting every instruction clock cycle or whether you're going to count every other one or every eight or every 16 that comes in. And for this, within the intcon register, you can set up an interrupt for when that timer overflows. On the data sheet, section 26, there is a lot of detail about the timers and counters in module timer zero, and that starts on page 271 in the data sheet. So let's talk a little bit about that. So the counter is in TMR zero, Intcon allows us to enable an interrupt and to track a flag for timer zero. So effectively, what will happen with an interrupt is when there are various events that are allowed to trigger interrupts, we will stop executing our current code and then we will go and handle them. We'll talk a lot more about interrupts later on. Within the option register, you can choose your clock source. So you can either select T0CKI or the instruction clock to be what we are counting. So you can count periods of the instruction clock or those external rising or falling edges. In the case of using the external T0CKI pin, you can designate either the falling edge or the rising edge of that particular signal to be what you are counting. If you're talking about using the internal instruction clock, you can still set as either rising or falling edge but because that is so periodic, it will really not matter, and all your count will be off by is about 500 nanoseconds if you were to choose uh, falling edge or rising edge as the count. The prescaler, um, PSA bit, 
determines whether or not you are using a prescaler. So if you do not assign a prescaler by putting a 1 in PSA, then you count every clock event or every rising or falling edge of T0CKI. If you put a 0 in the PSA, then a prescaler is assigned to that. And the prescaler is determined by three bits in PS0 through PS2. And the table that you see on the screen determines what three bit values determine the prescaler that you are using. So if you only want to count every two clock cycles, then you put in 000. zero, zero. If you want to wait until 256 cycles have come in before you increment the counter in timer zero, then you put a 111. And so these prescalers allow us to determine how often we're incrementing this counter that is tracking how many instruction cycles have passed. The other registers associated with this, we've talked about IntCon very briefly. We are going to be discussing IntCon in much more detail, but what you need to know is that GIE is used as the global interrupt enable. If you want an interrupt at all associated with timer zero or with anything else, then you must set bit seven in the IntCon. And then the TMR0IE enables the interrupt associated with timer zero overflows. And TMR0IF is a flag that tells you by setting it bit to one that the overflow has occurred for timer zero from FF to zero zero. Within the option register, the lower bits are all associated with timer zero, whether you're choosing the clock source, the edge, or the prescaler, and what the value is for that prescaler. TMR0 is going to be the register that will continually increment every time there is a timing event or a clock edge event. And then Tris A, of course, is associated because if we're using the external uh, T0CKI as an input, you need to make sure that that pin is an input and that is on port A, so we need to configure Tris A. Here is a block diagram for the timer zero module, and so you can see T0CKI is an external pin, so these little X's in a box is how uh, your PIC data sheet indicates external pins. And so this external pin is running into an exclusive OR gate, and you have here the edge selection. And so depending upon what edge you've chosen and what you have on the T0CKI, that will go into this multiplexer. The multiplexer will choose either the TMR0 uh, clock source as this external pin or as the instruction clock which is actually the frequency of the oscillator divided by four so our um, trainer kit actually has an eight megahertz crystal oscillator to drive the uh, timer or, or to drive the entire chip but each instruction cycle actually takes four periods of the general clock and so the actual instruction cycle is one-fourth of the frequency of the actual external clock so each instruction is actually being executed at two megahertz not the eight megahertz nominal for the oscillating crystal here you have the prescaler and so that is determining when you get in this clock if you're counting every one every two all of those different things so depending upon whether you've selected your prescaler or not if you've not selected the prescaler then the clock goes straight on through if you have selected the prescaler then you get this prescaled um, version of the clock which only counts every other one every fourth every eighth etc and then we come through here this synchronizes it and actually increments our timer zero and so if there is an overflow, the timer zero IF, which is the timer zero interrupt flag gets set. And this can also overflow into one of the timer one um, registers. So that is the basic building block of our timer zero. How do we use this? Well, you first of all need to determine how much time you want to pass until the timer overflows. How much time do you want before there is an interrupt event that you can handle? And so this is effectively just like if you think about setting your uh, oven timer and say, okay, I don't want to sit there and stare at the oven until my cake is done or whatever it is I'm baking. I want to set a timer, be able to walk away, handle other things, 
but as soon as I need to check whatever I have baking, I want something to alarm and indicate that to me. So effectively, that's what's happening when you have an interrupt and you're interrupting on an overflow, is you're presetting a time and then saying, okay, when that happens, when you have expired the amount of time, then interrupt it and handle it. And the way that works is you need to decide how much time you need and then you need to set up your TMR zero register to be enough below that that as it increments it will overflow after the amount of time has passed. So if the time is less than the amount of time that it would take for 256 instruction cycles to pass, choose no prescaler and you can initialize your TMR zero register to 256 minus the time desired. So if you wanted it to, let's say, work for 10 instruction cycles, set up a timer for 10 instruction cycles and then expire the timer after that, you would simply put 246 into the TMR zero and have no prescaler and then it would increment Every time there's a clock event from 246 to 247, 248, 249, 250, and then when it goes from 255 to 256, rolling back over to zero, then the timer would expire or overflow. If you want more time than that, you need to think about adding one of the prescalers. And so typically you would want to choose a prescaler that when you multiply that prescaler by the amount of time that each instruction cycle takes, that works out to be an even divisor as close as possible to the total time that you want. And so if you wanted, let's say, up to 512, you might choose a 2 to 1. If you wanted up to 1024, you might choose a 4 to 1. And then you still are going to set 256. Uh, so the total time is going to be 256 minus TMR0. So you're going to set your TMR0 accordingly so that the timer will overflow in the right amount of time. So here's an example. Let's suppose you want a one millisecond delay. Now, if we have the PLL enabled, then one instruction cycle will last one fourth as much as when we don't have the PLL enabled. So if you don't enable the PLL, and that's what we're gonna do in this example, then each instruction cycle lasts a half of a microsecond. And so if we want a full one millisecond, that means that we need 2,000 instruction cycles. Obviously, we're going to need a prescaler here because with an 8-bit timer, 2,000 is not going to fit within our TMR0. And so we also, since we want this to happen at a fixed interval, we want our clock source to come from the instruction clock, not based upon an external pin. So our TMR0CS is going to be from the instruction clock. And to get 2,000 instruction cycles, what we are going to do is assign the prescaler using PSA and we can choose a prescaler of 1 to 8 because we need 2000 and 8 evenly divides 2000 and so it turns out 8 times 250 is 2000 so we would need 250 groups of 8 instruction cycles to pass before 1 millisecond has gone by and so if we set our TMR0 to 250 less than 256, or in other words, 6, then it's going to increment 250 times. So what will happen is 8 instruction cycles will go by, and it'll increment from 6 to 7. Another 8 instruction cycles will go by, and it'll go from 7 to 8. And then eventually, it will overflow from 255 to 256 after a total of 2,000 instruction cycles, which would be a total of one millisecond in time. If you were using the PLL, then you would have to recalculate this based upon a clock that is four times faster. And so it's a simple matter of doing some algebra to figure out where you need to start the TMR0. Timer 1 is very similar to TMR0, but it is a 16-bit timer, allowing us to put larger values. It has a high byte and a low byte, so 16 bits are spread across the TMR1H and TMR1L, that's the high and the low registers holding those 16 bits. It can also be used in timer mode or counter mode, and in this case, its external pin is the T1CKI, and you can see more about this in the data sheet if you start reading through section 27, starting on page 274. 
It can also have a prescaler, but it does not have as many prescale options as the Timer Zero. So in this case, it only has four different prescale options, and you can set those up in the T1 con register, bits four and five. And it can also have an interrupt. This interrupt is not handled directly within the intcon register. It is actually one of the peripheral interrupts. And we'll talk more about that when we get into our interrupt lecture. But you can have an interrupt for timer one as well. So here are the various registers that are associated with timer one. And so we have um, some things in CM2 con one. And that's looking at gating of this. You can read more about this in the data sheet. Intcon is where we would configure our interrupt. Specifically, we would need the GIE bit, and because this is a peripheral interrupt, we would use the PEIE bit. And then the actual enable for this interrupt is in another register in the PIE, that's peripheral interrupt enable, the TMR1IE. That enables it, and then the flag is in the PIR1 register, the TMR1IF, that is the interrupt flag for timer one. And then the two registers holding the timer count are in TMR1H, TMR1L. And then you have the various configurations in terms of what the clock source is, um, whether you want rising or falling edge, very similar to the timer zero that is in T1Con. So within that, TMR1H, TMR1L are the registers holding the count. You can have the interrupts and you have the prescalers on the two bits that you see there. There is also the opportunity to enable, associated with timer one, an internal low frequency oscillator that oscillates at 32 kilohertz. And so that allows you, if your instruction cycle is a little bit too fast, to have a much slower time by using an internal oscillator rather than the instruction clock. So that's another option that you can associate with timer one. You can also use the external as we talked about, and then for this you would need to turn on timer one with the TMR1 on bit being set. So here are more on the, uh, the timer one registers, and so we have um, our ANCEL to make some things digital associated with that, and we have various other registers in terms of TRIS making things inputs, and then we have our global interrupt enables, and our peripheral interrupts in there. So we won't worry too much about timer one. I just want you to understand that it exists. It's different than timer zero. Primarily when we use timing, we will be using timer zero in class. So here is our block diagram. It's a little bit more complicated inside of timer one. So what you see down here at the bottom left is that is for our um, low frequency oscillator. Down here, this is a Schmidt trigger associated with our external input for that clock. And you can choose whether you want to use the frequency of the oscillator from the internal clock. You can choose the divide by four instruction clock. There's also another low frequency internal oscillator that you can choose. Your prescaler here is limited to one, two, four, or eight. And then we also have some other options in terms of uh, if you have things coming in as an overflow you can gate that way as well. Uh, D flip flop is what is used as the, the brain to clock these things in, um, whether you have things on and you are using gating as well. So there's much more to read about in the data sheet about this. I did just want to introduce you very briefly to timer one. So general usage, just to summarize for timers, you want to determine the time that they need to run, set your prescaler accordingly and initialize your timer zero or other initial uh, timer registers so that they overflow after the amount of time that you desire. And then you're gonna enable interrupts for the timer and then have an interrupt service routine which will check which flag is set and handle the timing. And so we'll talk much more about interrupts. This will make more sense once we get into talking about interrupts. But since we were talking about timing, it made sense at this point in the course to talk about our timers. And we will talk much more about how to handle those once we get into um, some labs involving interrupts.